allocation are things like interest rates, which is which is the biggest one, and you know like buy and sell factors. So for me, I take a top to bottom approach. So for me, interest rates are going to be the biggest economic factor that comes to investing. So with that being the case, if interest rates right well obviously first what is interest rates interest rates is basically the cost of debt or the cost to borrow debt so that is that is the first thing it's the cost to borrow debt so if interest rates go up that means that the cost to to borrow debt is going to rise so the federal reserve or the the federal open market committee it's um federal open market committee they decide what the interest rate is. So if interest rates go up, generally it's a good thing. Um, if the economy crashes, the Federal Reserve will lower interest rates to try and make borrowing cheaper. They're trying to make debt cheaper. So if debt is cheaper, it will allow people to spend, more people spend money on cars, mortgages, so it spurs the economy. How this affects investing is well like i said it's the cost of to borrowing debt so if you know that in, in my eyes um if if i know that interest rates are going up or in this case like we, we've been in a recession or we, we were in a recession in 2008 2009 so i know that the federal reserve lowered the interest rate if they lower the interest rate that means that a lot of companies are going to be taking advantage of the lower costs so one thing that i would look at is well what companies what industries are spending a lot of money mostly you know they have a lot of debt that would be companies that have a lot of capital intensive business models companies like plants um refineries um car manufacturers so i would typically avoid some of those because if you can look on their balance sheets, you'll see how much debt they have. And a lot of them kind of, they have a harder time when the economy goes sour. So also bonds, bonds are affected when the, when the price, when the interest rates change, bonds are affected. And actually bonds have an inverse relationship. When interest rates go up, bond prices go down. Because bonds, they have really two ways of making money. One is the, the coupon, the, the interest that you get from the, from the bond. The second is the price appreciation, but they're inversely related. So if the, pri if the interest rate goes up, bond prices will go down. For the, for the bonds that are currently on the market, they will go down in price. And the way, the way you look at it is, or the way I try to explain it is like, look, look at it like this. If interest rates go up, let's say you had a bond from like five years ago when the interest rate was 1% and you know, the economy's doing better. So the Federal Reserve ups the interest rate. Now it's, let's say two and a half or 3%. Well, when you go to sell that bond, it's gonna sell at a discount. Why? Because the investor, whoever's buying it is gonna say, why would I want this bond at full value if it's only yielding 1%? Somebody has to buy it. If one person purchases it, or sells it, the other person has to buy it. So the way to look at it is, you know, they're gonna ask them, why would I purchase this bond if I can get a bond that just now was issued and is yielding 3%, why would I want your bond for 1%? That's only yielding 1%. So you would have to sell that bond below value. So you actually can lose money on bonds. A lot of people that say, oh, you need to invest in stocks are more risky, bonds are, bonds are safer not necessarily that is the biggest myth i've ever i've ever heard because depending on what the interest rates do your bonds could actually lose value and in most cases you have inflation so inflation affects your returns so in here this is a graph of the risk return so this is set but and this is basically right now i think it's about three percent so the risk-free the risk-free rate of return, I'll put RF. The risk-free rate of return is what a basically what a government bond would be yielding right now, and I think they were like at two. 
it might have been three. It might have been three percent. I'm not. I'm not really sure. I have, I have to look at it again. But because the government is the safest asset that you can buy, like the, the bonds that they issue, because the the likelihood of them going belly up is highly unlikely. So most stock analysts generally view this as the risk-free rate of return. So it's going to be, you know, this is what the line is. Anything above this is where the risk typically goes up and the return also goes up. So things, so typically um, most average stock stocks, the large cap stocks are yielding seven to 8%. Um, and then you have like some middle sized companies that are a little bit bigger. Um, and obviously you have some some bonds that are cheap that are you know it's lower on the on the on the line and that will correlate to risk so if there's a bond these are government bonds you could buy treasury bonds in in this scenario you could buy treasury bonds you could buy municipal bonds um you can buy corporate bonds corporate bonds are, are basically bonds that are issued debt that is issued by corporations to raise money because a corporation can raise money through stock, through issuing stock, or through issuing debt. So typically, what I see is that, you know, a lot of um, corporations, like large caps, their, their yields are typically around four, maybe five and a half percent. So they're right here. So the government bond is right here. You can invest in, in you know, corporate bonds and get a higher return than what than what the government bond is yielding. Or if you want to invest in stocks, obviously the return will be higher. And then if it's, you know, depending on the stock. So, you know, again, stocks are affected depending on where, on, on what's happening with the interest rates. So, Another good thing to think about is when you're investing in stocks, um, you know, what is happening with the economy? Just to keep it simple, I would stick with with U.S. stocks because if once you start doing like foreign stocks and stuff like that, where it's in a different country, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky because then you have to watch out oh, what's happening in that country because there's things like systemic risk. There's things like um, currency risk. You know, if you invest in a company, you're investing in a, in a, in a, in stocks that are in India, for example, well, their currency is way, it has way less buying power than ours. So, and there's other risks as well, you know, um, and also, and also they have different, uh, regulations. So they may list some things on, on their balance sheet, or they may keep certain things off that, that we would, that we would have on ours. So just to make it simple, I would say, you know, just stick with U.S. stocks for now. And this is just a basic example uh, of a portfolio allocation. You have stocks, you have some cash, you have some bonds. And I also listed REITs here. And uh, REITs, I don't know if you know or may, may or may not know, REITs stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. They're almost the same thing as, as stocks. The only difference is REITs invest in real estate there's there are companies that are that are listed on the stock exchange that basically by law they have to invest 90 percent of their money into real estate and they have to pay out they have to pay out their their dividends typically when you have a stock you have dividends so you have price appreciation which you know price appreciation and you have dividends, which is like every month you get you get certain dividends. Um, and REITs are basically like I, I consider them souped up dividend yields. So a typical like a large cap stock might have, you know, probably like between a one and three uh, percent dividend. So if you know the stock is like at a hundred dollars a share. Then and it's at three percent has a three percent dividend. That means you get three dollar three dollars for every share. And REITs because they invest in real estate, which is usually a cash producing asset, their yields are usually around four, sometimes even like twelve or fifteen percent. But there is a downside to that. 
So they are giving you higher, you know, REITs, like I said, REITs, this is just, just general stocks um, versus REITs. REITs might yield on average, like I said, about four, 15%. I've seen some that are even higher. The only downside is the higher the yield is on, on the dividend, the lower the price appreciation because that's less money that they have to for, for to reinvest in their business. So what I see is that a lot of companies that have stocks that their dividend yields are like 1%, their stock prices over like a 10 year time frame, let's say this is 10 years, their stock their prices go their stock value goes way up because they're investing most of the money back into their business. Whereas if you have a stock that's like more mature so this could be listed in like small caps. You could have small caps. You could have big, larger companies. But the larger companies that have like, that offer like 3% or more, they're typically maybe, they're probably around this range, the seven to 8%. So you'll make around seven to 8% a year. But then again, there's also inflation risk. See, the biggest thing that I would say for most people is there's not just return, the risk, the rate of return, there's also inflation risk. So if you know that, and you can look up online like what the current inflation rate is. So if you know that the current inflation rate is let's say 2%, that means that 2% of your buying power is going away every year. So if you try to put your money in a savings account or like in a money market and the money market is yielding you know, let's say it's a one year CD or a three year CD and it's yielding 1%. Well, if the inflation rate, let's assume this is the inflation rate. If this is the inflation rate, you need to stay above this line. You need to stay above this line. And if the CD or whatever is offering like 1%, then you are losing money. You're losing money. Anything lower than that, that inflation rate, you're losing money. So I wouldn't put money into it. In that, in that case, I would probably put money either into a government bond, since people are saying like, oh, I wanna have cash on hand. I would put money in like a government bond or maybe even like a, um, a uh, corporate corporate bond. And I'm, I'm talking about like, look for a big, big company that, ha that is very unlikely to go bankrupt. Um, and I don't know if off the top of my head, it could be like a company like Facebook that they're, they're so big and they, you know, they um, they revolutionize so much. I, I highly doubt that they're going to go bankrupt. Now, other things may happen, but I highly doubt. Like if they're if they offer bonds, which most big companies do, if they offer bonds, there's a highly unlikely risk that they will not be able to pay the debt holder back. So if you if you buy you so you can so Facebook could offer bonds. You know you could you could have like AT and T. You know, they don't just offer stocks, their stock, they also offer bonds. So you could also look into theirs. And so if it's, if it's a bigger company, more established, their, you know, their sales are pretty consistent, then typically it'll be around four to 5%. And again, like I said, if you're holding cash, cash obviously doesn't yield much. Cash could also be, um, it could also be savings accounts. It could be money market again pretty much anything that's really liquid liquid within the year would be considered cash but again you also have that inflation risk so if you're gonna invest think about that for your overall portfolio because you want you want all these like whether you invest in REITs bonds cash stocks you want it to stay above the inflation rate because if if as you get older things are going to cost more and you want it to be above that amount. Because also think about it, you're, you're also pulling money out in retirement. You're pulling out 4%. So if you're pulling out 4%, let's say, because they say the general rule is 4%. The general rule is 4%. Well, if the inflation rate is also, let's say 2.5%. So you have 2.5%. Plus you need to withdraw 4%. Then that means that your investments need to generate at least six and a half percent return a year for your for your um for your portfolio for your money not to lose value and the only way that can happen because a lot of people they don't consider this they just say oh yeah yeah you know 
six to seven percent return is good or you know like I'm, I'm like as they get older you know they have different um they have different portfolio allocations you know they might say they might say um oh when you're younger when you're younger you know you might need 80 percent stocks and 20 percent bonds and as you get older, you might want to do 50% and 50% stocks to bonds. And then as you get older, like let's say you're in your 60s, then you want to be 70% uh, bonds and 30% cash. Or I'm, I'm sorry, not cash, uh, stocks. But the problem with that premise is that over the long term, you're basically, if your portfolio is well diversified, I would have more, honestly, I would have more, I would have more of this, more of this allocation, 80 to 20%. That's just me. Because I know enough about, me personally, I know enough about stocks that it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me. Like I know what stocks to, I know what investments to pick, and I'm not a stock trader. I don't, I don't trade. I, I invest for the long term. So I just want to clarify that. I invest for the long term. So I know what stocks. I can look at their financial statements, and I know what stocks, what companies are going to do well over time. So, for me, I would keep, keep it in here. I would stay. That, that's that's me. I don't know your situation, but because as you get older. Let's say you do this when you're 50, you're in your 20s, that's kind of whatever, you're in your 20s, and then by the time you're 70, you're over here, but the life, your life expectancy goes up. Let's say you live to be 85 years old. At this allocation, at this allocation, that's like, this is stocks and this is bonds. So if your bonds are only yielding like 3%, shit, 3%, and your stocks are yielding 8%, that portfolio allocation is doomed to fail because you're probably gonna average, I would probably say closer to three to 4% a year, which means that your money won't grow. And if there's any other expenses like Medicare or something like that, then obviously you're gonna run out of money so you you know you may have done this when you were seventy, changed the portfolio allocation when you were seventy. You might run run out of money by the time you're seventy five, maybe eighty. So if you live to be eighty five or you know older, then you ran out of money. Then you got to go back to work. So I can show you, I can go more in depth. I I there's several things that are going in my head, um, but this is just like a rough breakdown. Um, so if you do want to learn more, I can, like I said, I can show you videos. I can, I can do a video on my, on my laptop. I can show you tools that I use. I can even show you, like I said, more in depth. I can show you graphs. I can teach you economics. I can teach you, um, how to read balance sheets because my portfolio, believe it or not, my portfolio has actually generated roughly 20 to 25% returns over the past five years. Uh, I've been doing this for seven years and I'm not, I'm not licensed by any means, but I read a lot and I, I use the money that I have and I, I, I've been able to grow my portfolio at 20 to 25%. And really it's like, there's really only like a few main concepts that you have to know to generate, it's, it, to generate returns like that. It's not, it's really not that hard. Um, you know, Wall Street, they make you think that you have to know what they know and you, you know, you have to have like all these degrees and stuff, but there's four main, four to five main concepts that you have to be able to know to find winning companies or ETFs, if, if you know what that is, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make this video kind of short. Um, so if you have any further questions or any concerns or any, you know, like I said, any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me um, and I can clarify, clarify it on another video, okay?